In thy mercy we beseech thee, O Lord, grant to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that they may also be cleansed from all their sins, and also serve thee with a quiet mind. Words taken from today's opening prayer of the Collect. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy Mother Church recently celebrated the feast of St. Bruno of Cologne. St. Bruno was the founder of the Carthusians. The Carthusians, a religious order that is considered the most strict, the most austere, the most silent, and the most secluded in the church. And since the Carthusian order maintains a strict observance of humility, St. Bruno's cause was was actually never introduced. He was never formally canonized. Even as a young boy, St. Bruno was a serious child, focused in on eternal things and not caught up with the ever-changing things of this world. He was eventually ordained to the Holy Priesthood and became a canon at the cathedral charged with chanting the divine office. On one particular day, St. Bruno and the other canons of the cathedral were prayerfully chanting the office of the dead in the presence of a casket occupied by a fellow priest who had recently died. During the chanting of those psalms for the dead, the corpse of that priest literally came alive and rose up out of the coffin. The deceased priest then turned towards the choir of canons and stated, My brothers, I have been accused, I have been judged by God, and I have been damned. This had a great effect upon all who were praying the divine office that day. And already serious Bruno became ever more focused on the things of eternity and ended up founding the Carthusian order because he wanted to save his soul and give glory to God. The motto of the Carthusians is well known. It's a wonderful motto. In Latin, the motto reads, Stat crux dum volvitur orbis, or in English, The cross stands still while the world turns. The cross stands still while the world turns. Although the motto has never been officially interpreted by the Carthusians, the meaning seems fairly obvious. While all merely human affairs have their back and forths, their ups and downs, the rising and falling of nations and empires, Wars here, peace at this moment, triumph and tragedy, always a change, always restless. The cross of Christ remains constant, unmoving, consistent, rooting us when we cling to it in the divine, eternal stability because God is immutable, unchanging. Now the world is always restless and never at peace, always wanting change always wanting innovations, a new this, a new that, a new learning, a new age movement, a new mass, a new theology. The cross stands firm. Tradition remains consistent because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a result of this firmness in the cross and in tradition, St. Bruno's order has not experienced any radical changes in its way of life since it was founded almost a thousand years ago. Their their constitutions, their observance of the rule remains exactly the same. Their distinct Carthusian liturgy, by and large, did not experience the onslaught of the disastrous liturgical revolution. As the Carthusians often say, numquam reformata, quia numquam deformata. Never reformed because we've never been deformed. As many of you might know, the Carthusian monks in the snowy wilderness region near the Chartreuse Mountains in France started making a famous liqueur some 400 years ago known as Chartreuse. On every bottle sold, you will find that Carthusian motto along with an image of the cross planted on top of the world. It is a potent potable, to say the least, made up of a secret blend of 130 herbs and plants, 
Only a few monks know the secret ingredients and the proper blending of them. The recipe for this drink has not changed at all since it was written down in a manuscript in the year 1605 A.D. Nothing has been added. Nothing has been subtracted. Nothing superfluous. St. Bruno and the Carthusians have always been men of great faith, focused on eternal realities and not easily distracted by the passing things of this world. We can learn a lot from them because modern man is restless. He's rarely ever at peace. Modern man is also easily distracted by the things of this passing world. We view the news, we read the news new stories, and we're disturbed constantly. We're tossed and turned by every worldly event, whether in the world or in the church. We're also becoming ever more divided as one side pits itself against another side, distracting us from our main objective and our main enemies. The COVID crisis has brought much distraction. And it has caused us to think and focus too much on the temporal realm. All the experts, all our elites keep the population focused in on numbers. It's all about quantity. Flatten the curve. Numbers. How many COVID cases today? How many positive tests this past week? How many hospitalizations? How many vaxxed, unvaxxed? All about numbers. Quantity. That's all that matters. But few experts, few of our elites, speak about the quality of our life, especially as spiritual people. How people's lives and livelihoods have been severely harmed by these protocols and mandates which make the remedy infinitely worse than the actual virus itself. Churches have taken on the appearance of ICU wards And the quality of liturgy suffers as sanitizer replaces holy water and masks become the newest church vestment. We also find that people are distracted from focusing on the real threat and the real enemy that is out there. It's as if those in authority have purposely sought to divide us so that we will not unite against a growing government overreach. And so it becomes the masked versus the unmasked the vaxxed versus the unvaxxed, the vaccine cult versus something else. And yet we fail to focus on the real issue of the day, namely who sponsored, who paid for, where did the money come that brought about the gain-of-function research that allowed this SARS-CoV-2 virus to be so virulent and transmissible, to jump from one species to another, to spread from beast to man, which is not naturally do- it, it doesn't naturally do. Who released it upon humanity? And was it released by mistake? Was it released by negligence or purposely? These are the ultimate questions. As Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institutes of Health, stated in years past, interesting what he said, he just said, quote, in an unlikely but conceivable turn of events, what if that scientist who experimented on coronaviruses becomes infected with the virus, which leads to an outbreak and ultimately triggers a pandemic? In other words, we have all this research being done, trying to make this virus more virulent, more transmissible. What if it gets out in a pandemic? Dr. Fauci's answer to his own question. Scientists working in this field might say, as I indeed have said, that the benefits of such experiments and the resulting knowledge outweigh the risks. It's all worth risking it. The condition of being distracted, restless, and unfocused is also present within the membership of the church, including within traditional communities. It is such a blessing to be part of a traditional Latin Mass parish where people speak the common language of the faith. That is unusual for people to be openly speaking 
of the Catholic faith and the moral truths of our faith without fear of offending the other person next to you. We're united on the truths given to us by Christ through the apostles. Seeing our unity of faith, therefore, the demons will seek to divide us in other ways, through cliques, infighting, factionalism. In any parish, some can become distracted or divided on smaller matters that in the face of the present crisis we face are really insignificant. Small disputes that are molehills become quickly built up into mountains. We must rise above this and maintain a mature love for one another that endures and bears with the other. At this moment in time, we must focus in on the real threats, the real danger, the real adversaries. The traditional Latin mass and the traditional Catholic faith are presently under assault, serious assault. Let us then be united in facing off against that foe and the modernist virus present within the membership of the church. And in order to assist us in focusing in on defending the traditional Latin mass in the face of many enemies, the parish is offering as a gift to all registered families and individuals an essential book, I think, today for your spiritual reading. The book is entitled, Arlen's Loyalty to the Mass. Arlen's Loyalty to the Mass, and it's by a Capuchin friar, Father Augustine Hayden. In short, the book traces the times of persecution in Ireland, which lasted for centuries under the likes of Henry VIII, Thomas Cranmer, Queen Elizabeth, Cromwell, and so many other infamous heretics who despised what especially? The traditional Latin mass of Rome and the sacrifice that it represented upon the altar. The mass was to be destroyed. That's what heretics always said, destroy the mass, you destroy the church. This book shows a love for the mass of old. How many centuries the Irish were persecuted for going to it, and yet they still went to it. A love that would sacrifice everything for it, even die for it. The enemy knew that the surest way of eradicating the mass was to eliminate the priests. But though hunted down like wild beasts, imprisoned and starved, and tortured and executed, the priests could not so easily be exterminated. By careful hiding, they were able to say mass now and then in private homes. Mass had often had to be celebrated in the open air, on a mountainside, or in a remote rocky glen to avoid the attention of priest hunters. The people were previously notified of the meeting place, and when they came to Mass, they would confess their sins first and then receive the most blessed of all sacraments. And many brave men and women of stature befriended these priests, hid them in their homes, and cared for their material needs. Many prominent lay people suffered under the anti-Catholic legislation. From legal records, we know that many suffered heavy fines, long spells of imprisonment, and even death for their adherence to the Catholic faith and to the Holy Mass. That was the only thing they had to do, according to the Protestant leaders. Don't go to that Mass, and you'll be treated well. They still went to that Mass. Our love for the faith and our love for the Holy Mass of Rome will unite us. And it will keep us focused on what really matters, eternity, keeping the Catholic faith, which is the only faith that pleases God, staying in a state of grace and defending this Mass, which is the Mass of all the saints that we love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.